Span One's program counter is made of two 8-bit counters and a register. But there's actually five chips here. There's two 4-bit counters, another two 4-bit counters, and a register. These two 4-bit counters make up the 8-bit PC low part of the program counter. And these two counters here make up the PC high, and this register here I'll talk about in a minute. So let's just zoom in on this so we can understand why this register here is necessary. So let's assume that we had these two 8-bit counters both connected to the bus and to do a jump I load 8 bits into the program counter high and another 8 bits into the program counter low and then this changes to the new 16-bit address. But what, there's a problem there isn't there because as soon as I load this first register this address changes and I'm off in some you know fairly arbitrary bit of memory program falls over. So that's never going to work. So what I decided to do was add this register here in front of the high byte of the uh, program counter. Now the way I achieve a jump is I first load 8 bits into this register here as a staging register. When I want to execute the jump I, I load the 8 bits that are needed for the program counter low register and simultaneously bump the value from the staging register into program counter high. So by doing that, um, a 16-bit value arrives atomically in this pair of registers here. And so this value here changes in the deterministic and the correct manner. The schematic shows four 74HC T163 registers organized in a chained manner. So as the um, low counter ticks over, it causes the next counter to tick and so and so forth up through the, through the four counters and that gives me a full 16-bit range. Here's the register that I was talking about a moment ago. You can see that the low byte of the program counter is directly connected to the ALU result bus, the output of the ALU, but the input lines to the high byte of the program counter, they come via this register and the register is connected out onto the ALU result bus. Now that's five chips. There's a sixth one here. I forgot about that. And there's not enough space on my board now for that. So I may actually do that bit of functionality there with um, a bit of diode logic. So I'll, co I'll come back to that sometime in future, I think. This piece is actually only necessary if I want to do um, local jumps. So a jump in the current page, so a jump where I'm not going to be changing the high byte of the program counter, only the low byte. So a jump within whatever current page the program counter is pointing at. That's not um, absolutely necessary. The control lines I've got going in, we've got a clock. Now all of these chips are synchronous. Even the uh, master reset on these chips here is a synchronous reset. And that's a good thing, it makes for predictable behavior and no glitchy um, weirdness. Um, so if I want to achieve a, a reset, knock all these counters back to zero, then I hold the master reset low and put a positive edge on the clock here. If I want to load the um, high byte into the staging register off the, off the ALU result bus, then I hold this PC high TMP in line low and again, put positive edge on the clock line. And likewise, to load into the um, low register, then I'll hold the, um, the necessary lines low and put a positive edge on, the, on that line there. Now the names of the pins on these devices here, I've taken from one particular data sheet. When I looked at the data sheets, they all seem to have different names for these pins, which is a bit confusing. Let's just take a quick look at that. So there are some images from different data sheets, Texas Instruments, I don't know who else, a few others. But you can see, I mean, on one data sheet, you've got ENP, another one's Enabled P, over here we've got CEP. But what do all these acronyms even mean? I actually wanted to understand what the acronyms meant and how these chips were meant to be used. And when I dug around looking for information, I actually couldn't find very much. I could find some examples of use, but I couldn't find any reference material coming from the data sheets themselves. I dug around for quite a while and eventually I came across a Texas Instrument data sheet that showed them a, uh, a couple of ways of wiring these things up. 
So here we've got the Texas Instruments data sheet. Um, there's our parallel inputs for the counter. There's four bits in. Uh, the four bits count outputs. We've got a clear input. That's my master reset the clock. Um, this ripple count out, that's, that's used to set up that chaining that I was referring to. You pass that into the enable trickle uh, input of the next chip in the, in the chain. Load input, when that's held low, it, it takes the uh, value off the four input bits and puts them into the internal register so that the next count that occurs will start from whatever was just loaded. If we look into the back of the data sheet, can see those diagrams that I was referring to. You've got these two applications. And they're subtly different. One's talking about ripple carry mode and the other one's talking about um, carry look ahead. Sadly, there isn't a great deal of an explanation about why you'd prefer one over the other. There are some timing equations here, but usually when you see things like timing equations and multiple options, there's some kind of compromise no information is given. So I wasn't able to find any particular information about which one was better and what the trade-offs were, so I went for this one here because it looked simpler to me. And that's the one that I've um, set up in my Verilog simulation, and that's the one that I've just built on the breadboard. Now, the counter I've used, 74163, it's a 4-bit counter. After I'd built this, I came across this device here, 74869, which is essentially the same device, um, except that it's 8 bits. So if I'd used this, I'd have had a bit less wiring. It is an ALS chip and not an HCT chip, but I don't think that would have made a great deal of difference to me, to be honest. Let's take a quick look back at the actual breadboard and see it in action. It's always nice to see some blinking lights. Okay, so here we are again. Let's just turn on the program counter. Right, so it looks like the two counters here these uh, two 8-bit counters, have picked up some random values. Now that, that can happen when you turn on your CPU, but we have a solution for that. It's called the master reset. We pull that low, and then we clock the program counter. There we are. Both these counters have been reset to zero. So let's bring that master reset high again. Now the next thing to demonstrate is a jump. Now, if you recall, the way a jump works is we first load the high order byte into the staging register. That's the first instruction. And then a second instruction loads the low order byte from the bus, but simultaneously pulls that value across from the staging register into the high order byte of the program counter. So the first thing to do is to load something into the staging register. I've set up the inputs of this staging register as four bits high and four bits low. So let's just clock that into the register. So let's pull its enable input low, and let's clock the program counter. Right, so you might have noticed the program counter counted on there whilst this was being loaded. That's perfectly, that's what exactly what we want to happen. It's moving on to the next instruction. But of course this is noisy, so we see more than one count. But right now we hope that in this register here we've got one, 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 naught, 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 naught. And we want that to end up in the high order byte of the program counter, and we want what's on the bus to end up on the low order byte of the program counter. So let's execute that jump. Let's bring the, um, that high again. And now let's bring this one low. This is the parallel enable input, which causes the jump to occur. Let's clock it. Excellent. So there we can see we've got high, 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 low, 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 which is what we set up here on the staging register. And we've got alternating ones and noughts, which is what we've got on the bus. Now, while setting this up um, a few minutes ago, I noticed some erratic behavior. I noticed that sometimes this count function doesn't work. Right now, all of the control lines are high, so we're not enabling a load, we're not enabling a jump, and we're not doing a master reset. So in that situation, when I um, toggle the clock, it should count. Let's just see what it does. Now, I hope you can see that. It's not counting. And this seems a bit erratic, so I know there's something wrong with the circuit, but I've simulated this in using Verilog. And so I'm pretty confident that I have a solution in Verilog, but there's something wrong with my implementation here in hardware. Um, now I was looking very carefully, I looked through all the wires and I noticed that this enable pin here 
is connected to all the other chips. That's the parallel enable input on the 74HCT163. Now that isn't connected to anything other than there's other chips, so that input is floating. Now I'm pretty sure it's either a one or a naught that's meant to be hard coded to, but which of those two? Now I could look at the schematic, but the schematic is just documentation. I've got this simulation in Verilog, and to be honest, I trust that. It runs, it works. Um, so let's take just take a look at that and see what the Verilog simulation says that that input ought to be set to. Right, so here's the program counter model. Let me just open it up. Right, if we scroll down, we can see how the 474163s are wired up. And what I can see is that this um, parallel enable for count is set to one, and it's set to one on all of the chips. So those are, that's the wire that's bridged across all the chips, and I need to connect it to logic one. Brilliant, fantastic. Um, what I can also show you briefly is, well, here's some tests, tests for the program counter. Um, and so that gives me a high degree of confidence that the circuit actually works the way I intend it to. And when I put it into the larger piece, which is the CPU as a whole, I'm expecting it to, to do, the, do the right thing. So let's go back and look at the, um, at the hardware. Okay, so the simulation says it should be set high. So let's just do that and see whether it cures the problem. There we are. Now let's try clocking. Excellent. Excellent. It's working. Brilliant. So that very log simulation is absolutely invaluable. I'm making this CPU up as I go along. And I honestly think that if I didn't have the simulation, I wouldn't have a hope of getting this right. Now, of course, all of that depends on whether or not the models I've got set up for these chips in Verilog are actually functionally accurate. But the approach I've taken to those is to write a whole bunch of automated tests. So I'm reasonably confident. Sure, there can be bugs, but fingers crossed there won't be too many of them. And I've also taken um, the time to try and get the delays in, in the chips, in the models, um, reasonably accurate. And what that's highlighted has been, you know, the odd glitch, which is exactly what I wanted to find out. And then I've got the choice of whether I should squash the glitch entirely or whether there's a problem with the design of the circuit that makes it sensitive to that glitch. So it's, it's, it's been absolutely, um, you know, worth its weight in gold to me. And thanks to Warren Toomey for recommending that I do that. So anyone out there who's thinking of designing their own CPU, get yourself a simulator. So clearly there's a wire I have to add here, which I'll put in later, but otherwise I'm pretty confident that this program counter is going to do the job for me. And the one thing I haven't demonstrated yet is hooking the program counter up to a clock. Let's just do that. Just off to the side here, I've got an oscillator. There we are, flying around.